The first lecture in this new series was centered on a great painting of the Yuan Dynasty, uh, Wang Lung's Dwelling in the Qingbian Mountains. Uh, the second was by a recent, on a recent artist, Cheng Shi Fa. For this third, we return to the Yuan Dynasty uh, to consider the works of another of the so-called four great masters of Yuan Dynasty landscape, that is Huang Gong Wang. I had meant originally to concentrate again on a single work of his, that is his great hand scroll dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains, which he painted in over a three-year period, 1347 to 1350. But um, when I re reassembled the images and looked at them, it became apparent that uh, it was a lec so the lecture on Huang Gong Wang more generally, including most of the surviving works of this great artist, would be more interesting and more valuable. So that's what I'm attempting in this lecture that follows. The first images, please. These are not paintings by Huang Gong Wang, but by uh, another artist, more or less contemporary, a little bit earlier, I guess, named Wu Zhan. Wu Zhan is the first of the four great masters. Um, well, what happened is this. Uh, when I finished my master's degree back in 1953, was it, in Ann Arbor, uh, and took on my uh, dissertation topic, I decided and I announced that I was going to do all four of the four great masters of the Yuan dynasty. Uh, ha, too ambitious. And if I had waited and done all four of them for a dissertation, it would have taken me years and years. So I started off with Wu Zhan. I thought I'd finish him off quickly and then do the others. Why Wu Zhan first? He's maybe the least interesting of the four great masters in his paintings, although he's, he's all right. Um, I spent a lot of time on him. But um, I, I was going to use each of them to uh, take on a certain larger topic. And Wu Zhan was going to be the matter of literati painting theory. I realized that he had written a lot about this and so I could use use him for that. And I realized I had to do that first. And then I was going to do uh, Huang Gong Wang on some aspect of style, I guess it was, and Need on, on the relationship between the artist and his paintings, etc. I had plans for all four of them. And then I amassed huge amounts of information on them, binders and card files. Okay. Well, I finished Wu John. I got my PhD in 1958, I think it was. The dissertation was never published, not really a great book. But the section on literati painting, uh, which was half of the dissertation, did have a big impact on the field of Chinese painting after its appearance in 1958. It was used in academic programs all over, uh, in the University Microfilms edition. Uh, it was redone, that is this t large topic of literati painting theory, uh, by Susan Bush with some help from a scholar named Achilles Fong. And her book was published in 1971, Chinese Literati on Painting. Um, it used my work heavily, as she acknowledged. Um, well, I meant to do the other three. Huang Gong Wang, the safer style, needs on for the relationship between the artist and his life and his paintings. Wang Meng, I can't remember for what. doesn't matter. At any rate, it would have been a grand climax. But um, I've already devoted one of these lectures to one of Wang Meng's masterworks, and I'll have another lecture talking about more of them. Meanwhile, this one will be on Huang Gong Wang. The next, please. Here's a double page from my book, Hills Beyond a River. Uh, Huang Gong Wang's masterwork, the Fuchun Scroll, which I'll talk about at length later, has recently been in the news in a way that I'll relate when we come to it. The first section of the scroll was cut off back in the early, Ming dynasty, early Qing Dynasty, that is, in 1650, and some of it was lost, but a surviving section called the Cut Off Mountains was saved and mount, mounted separately. And that section is now in the Zhejiang Provincial Museum in China. I saw it there and photographed it back in 1973, and I was able to publish it together with the remainder of the scroll, which is kept in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, proclaiming them as together again for the first time in 300 years. Uh, it wasn't common at that time for people to be able to go to visit both Chinas. More recently, the two have been physically united for a time, exhibited together, that is, when the Zhejiang Muse Provincial Museum 
lent this cutoff fragment to the National Palace Museum in Taipei, and they were shown together with great fanfare, much, much news, and lots of people went to see them. Well, that gives a certain timeliness to this lecture, which will try to put the great work of the uh, Fuchun Mountain Scroll into context and look at it at length. Okay, next please. Here's a portrait of uh, Huang Gong Wang, which is mounted before the uh, the uh, um, cut off fragment in the in that scroll. Uh, it's a portrait from the mid 19th century, not early. Huang Gong Wang was born in 1269 near Suzhou uh, in a poor family. He was adopted into another family early on. Uh, he was a child prodigy. He tried when he grew up for the civil service career, but was unsuccessful, and he retired and became a teacher of philosophy, and quite famous as that. And then he became a recluse living in the Fuchun Mountains, west of Hangzhou, or near there. Uh, he had many friends and admirers. He died in 1354 at the age of 85, by our mode of counting age. And as someone who reached that age a few weeks ago, I can testify that you feel you've been around for a long, long time. Well, okay. On pages 86 to 88 of my Hills Beyond the River book is a translation of Huang Gong Wang's so-called essay on painting. This essay was published in a miscellany titled Zhao Gong Lu by Tao Chung Yi, published in 1366. Tao Chung Yi and his text were the subjects of research by my good friend Frederick or Fritz Moat and I corresponded with him about it. I had, already, I had already done a draft translation of Huang Gong Wang's essay while I was a Fulbright student in Japan working with Shimada. Since my translation is available in that book, I won't take the time to quote from it here. It isn't an organized essay, as I say, but it's rather a series of notes, perhaps as written down by his students to preserve them. Uh, nevertheless, it's the next most important piece of writing about landscape painting, uh, after the essay by Guo Xi, and it's well deserving the attention of any serious student. So you can read that. I won't talk about it. Huang Gong Wang lived as a hermit, actually visited by many people, so he wasn't that er hermit-like, eremitical, in his late years, and he died in 1354. Uh, there are various stories told about how he appeared as a spirit after his death. He had become somewhat legendary. Now we go on to Huang's paintings. Beginning, next please. Beginning with, um, well, I once wrote that there were probably four or five genuine works by him extant, no more than that, at best. Um, more recently, more paintings have turned up in various collections, and now I'd be a bit more accepting, but still there's only a few, maybe seven or eight, we'll see. I'll show most of them in this lecture. In contrast with Nizan and Wang Meng, that is, uh, for both of whom we have many more works that survive. I give long lectures on each of them with many, many works. Okay, here is a painting dated 1335, which I know only from reproduction. The first dated work by Huang Gong Wang that is known to me, that stands any chance of being genuine, is this uh, painting of Cloudy Mountains and Winding River. It's known only in an old reproduction in a series called Ming Ren Chuhua, published in Shanghai, 1920-25. It's in number 23 in that series. The subject looks very commonplace, but we should remember the date. This could well be the earliest datable example of a landscape type that would be endlessly reworked by literati painters throughout the centuries that followed. Uh, why, why is it you think that my book on your own painting was called Hills Beyond a River because that's what much of it is about. Uh, if I were to write landscape with trees on a shore, hills rising beyond with houses and more trees, I've described thousands or tens of thousands of paintings by literati artists painted over the centuries, whole albums of them differing only from leaf to leaf in the old style that the artist is adopting, are a specialty of the so-called orthodox masters of the early Qing period. And here we are close to the beginning of this type. For that reason alone, this unimpressive looking image has some art historical importance. The next, please. Um, this album leaf, titled Jurlon Shir, The Orchid Studio, is also known only in reproduction. It was one leaf in a famous lost album. 
the same one that uh, also included a painting ascribed to Wang Wei, which I showed in my lecture on Tang Landscape. It was accompanied, this leaf was, by a leaf of calligraphy by Huang Gong Wang, identifying the subject and supplying the date, 1342. I don't have a slide of that or an image. The subject of this is much the same as the one I showed before. That is a hill with trees and houses at its base. But in style, it brings us a step closer to the mature works of Huang Gong Wang. The projecting flat top forms at the right top of the hill. The clusters of lumpy forms or boulders partway up the hill, set in dark vegetation. One form at the right of these with a kind of Y drawn on it. Huang advises in his essay that stones have three sides, and he said uh, they're the top and the left and the right. And this appears to be a rather schematic way he, he devised to give them three sides by drawing a kind of Y that uh, defines the edges of the facets, top and two sides. This form would be endlessly repeated in later Landscapes in the manner of Huang Gong Wang. Artist after artist after artist does it. Um, the neat schematic way that the houses are drawn also belongs to Huang's manner. This small painting is important, that is, to his development, and we wish we had it in the original. The next, please. Now, <clears throat> what may be his earliest work that's still accessible is the hand scroll titled Rivers and Hills Before Rain. I showed it before together with a copy of it in my lecture on authenticity and dating. In his inscription on it, written in 1344, Huang Gong Wang writes that he painted it, quote, some years ago, so it probably dates to the early 1340s. I had the honor of being the first to publish it in adequate reproductions in my 1976 Hills Beyond a River book. It had just been discovered in the Palace Museum collection in Beijing. Huang, in his inscription, recounts how someone had brought him two sheets of good quality painting paper asking for a painting, and how he, quote, did it in a moment, trusting my hand. That last, Xin uh trusting my hand, is a term popular among the amateur artists for works done spontaneously without careful planning, suggesting that they didn't stop to plan the painting in their minds, they just went ahead and painted trusting their hands. And in fact, as you know, that's a common way to paint small things. I mean, when we write uh, longhand, we don't stop and think how we're going to write the next letter. We just trust our hands, so they just write it. It's built into our hands, so to speak. Budberg always told us that you know, to learn to write Chinese characters, you had to get it in your hands rather than your mind, and so on. Okay, uh, here is the same idea applied to painting. Next, please. A close-up detail from the um, a foreground group of trees and bushes reveals the air of spontaneity that Huang maintains in his execution of the painting. Looking closely at it, as we are here, one has a sense of knowing the way the artist laid the successive strokes down, how he calculated the ink tones, how he worked that fine border between control and spontaneity. This continues to be quietly a quietly prominent feature of Huang Gong Wang's painting. Nothing quite like it had been seen before, even in earlier literati painting. I'll show close-up details from his great Fuchun scroll and make this point again. Next, please. The distant hills are, again, outwardly plain, but quietly absorbing, with small controlled brushstrokes, varying in type and tonality, building up the forms. We see here the real beginnings of the later development of the orthodox school landscape, as artists of the 17th century and after came to appreciate this way of painting and to follow it. The system of overlaying brushworks, darker and drier, over paler and wetter, might be seen as beginning back in the Song Dynasty with the early works of literati painting. Of these, the Red Cliff Scroll by Chao Zheng Chang, a follower of Li Gong Lin, which we saw at length, accomplishes this on a higher level than any of the surviving works associated with Li Gongwen himself. In any case, it reaches its full realization in the Yuan Dynasty, in the early Yuan Dynasty, and in the paintings of Huang Gongwang, as these close-up details reveal. Next, please. The scroll ends, as the later and more famous Fuchun Mountain Scroll would end, with simply drawn hills as if he had finished it off quickly 
to satisfy the person it was promised to. Here we see another feature of Huang Gongwang's paintings that have endeared them to later connoisseurs, the insertion of the personal and momentary into his inscriptions. This is another new feature in Yuan literati painting. I used to use as an example, next please. Here is the, um, I, I, what I used to use was the ending of Wu Zhan's hand scroll titled Eight Views of Jia He. This is not it, I don't have a slide of that. But this is another section of the same scroll which will serve our purpose. Anyway, uh, it's a scroll that he painted around the same time as uh, Huang Gong Wang's, that is in 1344. Uh, in the first of his many inscriptions on this scroll, Wu Zhan asks, well, if the Shaoshang region can have eight views, why not my hometown, Jiaxing or Jia He? And he goes on to paint uh, his views of Jia He and uh, f uh, painting these familiar places and writing notes about them. And he ends the scroll, I don't as I say have an image of it available, he ends it with an image of a certain temple located near his home and a pavilion outside it built over a famous well, a well from which tea water was drawn. Uh, he writes that if one looks closely at his picture, one can see that this pavilion is in need of repair. And indeed, if you look closely, it's uh, shown with its railings leaning outward and so on. Um, and he adds that the monks of the temple would like to repair it, but they don't have the funds. And if any viewer of this scroll would like to make a contribution, it will be much appreciated. Ha <laughs> ha. This and the Huang Gung Wang examples we'll see represent a new kind of amiable departure from the old tradition of the painting as a kind of timeless ideal image. Next, please. A major work by Huang Gung Wang that we should spend some time with is his hanging scroll titled The Stone Cliff at the Pond of Heaven. It exists in a number of versions, some of which are listed in my long entry for the painting in my index, uh, which begins with what I take to be the oldest and the best version in the Palace Museum in Beijing, and that's the one now on the screen. I suggested back then that this too might in fact be a Ming copy, and now I'll present it as perhaps an original work by Huang Gong Wang, but in any case, even if it is a good copy, the best evidence we have for a great painting by him, which we have to pay attention to. Uh, the next please. Huang Gong Wang's own inscription on it, written in his neat square script, almost too formal and lacking in character to inspire confidence in it, gives the date as the first year of the Zhejiang era, 1341, uses his Hao or studio name, Da Chu Daoran, the Great Fool, identifies the recipient of the painting as a certain Xingzhur and adds, I made this stone cliff at the Pond of Heaven picture, and he adds, uh, done at the age of 73. The longer inscription at right on the painting is by uh, a man named Liu Guan, who was a Hanlin Academy scholar, one of the principal authors of the Yuan history. The next please. The place represented is on Mount Hua near Suzhou. I've never been there, and I know only representations of it, which generally agree with Huang's. That is, there's a pond high up in, uh, in a mountain valley, buildings built around it, a stone cliff rising beside it or behind it. Uh, in any case, it's a minor element in Huang's painting, which is about other things than topography. The next, please. Reading the painting in the reverse order of the usual and proper way, from top to bottom, that is, the rising ridge that dominates the picture can be seen to be a composed of elements familiar from Huang's earlier paintings that we've seen, clusters of small repeated forms, horizontally lined up and uh, surmounted or backed by dark vegetation, a few flat top masses, upward curving ground lines enclosing these, all arranged in a quasi-formal arrangement. It's a new manner or mode of formal construction as I termed it long ago in my lectures my seminars of the 1960s, 70s. Uh, uh, that was to serve as a model for countless later artists and their landscape paintings. The next please. In the first lecture in this new series, which was on Wang Meng's Qingyuan Mountain painting, I showed a work that the late Ming artist Dong Chi Chong painted in 1617, his own Qingyuan Mountain picture, which as he writes, on it is based on a work by Zhao Mengfu, 
but which adopts, as you see here in the right part of this detail, Huang Gong Wang's system of constructing the ascending mountainside part by part. Next, please. Even one of the great individualist masters, and one who is sometimes called a mad painter, I have a special lecture on him and on this idea of mad painters, that is Zhu Da, or Bada Shanran, in the early Qing period. Even he employs and echoes Huang Gong Wang's system in one of his own landscapes seen here. These are in fact two of the paintings I use in making my argument about how later Chinese painting draws on its past, much of the best of it anyway. In my pivotal 1999 lecture, not published until 2005, titled Some Thoughts on the History and Post-History of Chinese Painting, a lecture that really underlies this whole series, arguing as it does that landscape painting of the post-Sung period, at least much of the best of it, can have no history because it draws so consciously on its own past. So it belongs to what Hans Belting calls a post-historical period. I would really recommend that lecture to, or that article to all of you who are significantly interested in the subject. Uh, and if you haven't already read it, uh, you'll find it in the Archives of Asian Art, number 40, where it's published, or it's on my website as CLP 34. Haley Lecture, 1999. Next, please. Back to Huang Gong Wang's mode of constructing the mountain. I could show many more paintings that use it, if I had the time and the slides. The Orthodox school landscapists who followed Dong Chi Chang made it an element of their pictures in Huang Gong Wang style. This is a leaf from an album by Wang Jian, one of them painted in 1666, and inscribed as being in Huang's manner and featuring that ascending hillside at left, as you see. The first of my students to take a PhD under me, Mayana Pong, who went on to become a curator in Melbourne, Australia, at the Victoria Art Gallery, as I remember, wrote about this mode of formal construction in her dissertation topic. It was, we concluded as we studied it, it was an epoch-making innovation in Chinese landscape painting. Next, please. A good image of the central section of this painting reveals how con consistently and effectively this mode of construction dominates the central mass of the painting, the rising ridge. It's perhaps suspiciously neat, adding to the suspicion that we're dealing with a copy. But as I began by saying, it's the best version we have of this very important work, and we have to make the best of it. Next, please. The lower half of the painting is uh, a pretty uh, in a pretty good image. Now here too, the multiplicity of forms, not softened and integrated into a simpler image, might make us suspect that we're looking at a later copy, not an original by Huang Gong Wang. But it presumably presents us with a pretty good reproduction in some respects of Huang's original. Some of you with sharp eyes and familiarity with later Chinese painting may by now be saying to yourselves, Wang Yuan Qi. But and there are indeed similarities in style to the works of that major early Qing Orthodox master. I won't take the time to point them out in detail. Next, please. In this monochrome detail of the lower right corner, not completely contained in the other image, we see another pond and more buildings and, uh, and other familiar elements, including one of the rocks with a Y mark on it. The rows of trees and the bushes are of different types, some of them leaning, belong to Huang Huang Gong Wang's landscape repertory. Next. Uh, an image from just to the left of that detail, still in the lower right of the painting. Um, a better detail that reveals more closely how the painting looks close up. Even while we're saying inwardly, looks like Wang Ren Shi to me, we can recognize from the Huang Gong Wang repertory the groupings of different kinds of trees and bushes, and grant that this is probably the best evidence we have for a great lost Huang Gong Wang original. Next, please. Finally, a monochrome image of the lower left corner. I really don't know where all these images come from, and I apologize again for the lack of consistency. They're all I have, and they're much better than none at all. Uh, houses drawn simply in uh, Huang's manner appear behind the tall pine trees, and the groups of varied trees beside and behind them mark out the space. A stream flows through, eventually to reach the pond in the lower right of the composition. This closes our consideration of this best surviving version of a great and influential painting, which we can enjoy as we might perhaps 
a Mahler reorchestration and reworking of a lost symphony by Beethoven. Next, please. It appears now that the version of the Huang Gung Wang stone cliff at the Pond of Heaven scroll that I just showed was probably not the one in the Palace Museum in Beijing, as I said, but more likely the one on the National Palace Museum in Taipei. On page 281 of my index of early Chinese painters and paintings in the section on Huang Gung Wang, I list all the versions of this painting known to me, all, I believe, good copies, none of them the original. One of them is in Siren, Volume 6, Plate 71, and this is the version in the Palace Museum in Beijing, and my image of that is now on the screen. Quite honestly, I'm confused myself about the various versions, and which of my slides represents which. The images I just showed, I now believe, were mostly from the version in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. Now I've found still another set of images, which may be of still another version. I'm not clear which or where, but I'll show it as another good copy of this important composition. Next, please. Here's the upper part of it. I don't seem to have a slide of the whole. And you see that the inscriptions at the top, seen only in part here, are the long one by Liu Guan, which is seen also on the Taipei version, only in a different position, and the shorter inscription by the artist Huang Gung Wang, uh, seen only in part in the upper right. I'll show the details of this painting, this copy, with minimal comment, just so that those of you seriously interested in the artist and in this famous painting can look at them. This will be another great topic for some grad student. Track down the various versions, compare them, try to decide which is the earlier and closest to the original, and why why it is the closest. I myself can't do that. Next. Here is the upper right part that depicts the place of the title, that is the stone cliff and the pond of heaven. The coloring is in that combination of cool blue-green and warm, warmer yellow-orange colors that comes to be standard in literati landscape. We don't know just when it was first used or whether Huang Gung Wang used it. Next, please. The main slope of the rising ridge showing that systematic build-up of repeated forms that I spoke about at some length with respect to the same passage in the other version. Once more, we are uncomfortably reminded of the style of Wang Yuan Qi in the early Qing period. Is it a copy by him, or at least of his period? Good question. Next, please. Further down, here is the whole lower part. This version seems, on the whole, better integrated than the other probably closer to Huang's original, or maybe just by a better artist. Next, please. The lower left corner with the tall pine trees. In any case, the different versions of the composition agree well enough with each other that we can probably take them to be reasonably faithful renderings of the whole structure, at least, of Huang Gung Wang's great lost painting. Next. Moving closer into the lower right section, simply drawn houses, trees with their trunks bare, a body of water in lower right. And again, uncomfortable resemblances to the style of Wang Yuan Qi in the early Qing period. Next. A closer in detail of this lower right corner. One of the rocks, as you see, has on it the Y marking that comes to be part of the Huang Gung Wang Manor. Well, so ends this rather confused and inconclusive treatment of this major work by Huang Gung Wang, which is the best I can do with the materials I have. It will be, as I say, a great topic for a serious study in the future, with all the recent attention to Huang's Fuchun Mountain Scroll, which we'll turn to next. This one has been pretty much neglected. So now we go on to that great Hen Scroll. And so we arrive at the real climax and the central work of this lecture, that is Huang Gung Wang's great uh, Dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains Hen Scroll which he painted from 1347 to 1350. It's painted in ink on paper, and it's 33 centimeters tall, a third of a meter, that is, and 6.4 meters long without the fragment, uh, that is, just the main scroll, which I say is now in Taipei. How it came to be painted is recounted in Huang's own inscription at the end of the scroll, of which I don't seem to have a slide. I'll read this from my old... Uh, Hills Beyond a River book, page 111, while we roll through the scroll in a 
provisional way. Okay, here we go. Huang Gung Wang writes this. In the seventh year of the Zhejiang era, that's 1347, I returned to my Fuchun Mountains residence in the company of Master Wu Yong. Wu Yong means something like no, no use, useless. On a leisure day in the South Tower, I took up the brush and drew this whole scroll. Such was my exhilaration that I was not conscious of the passage of time, that is, but untiringly laid out the entire composition. Moreover, whenever I needed to eradicate anything, I would fill in uh, what I had cut out, presumably with new sections of paper. I've gone over it now for three or four years, but I still haven't quite finished it. This is because I always left it behind in the mountains during my trips into the outer world. Now I've taken it again from my luggage so that whenever I have a spare moment, morning or night, I can add some more brushwork. Wu Yong is over anxious that someone else will get it away from me by craft or force, and he has made me inscribe it in advance, that is, inscribe it before finishing the painting, at the end of the scroll in order to let everyone know the difficult difficulties I had in completing it. Tenth year, 1350 that is, uh, the green dragon cyclical signs being at Gungyin, one day before the Chujie, that is the day of the excited insects, uh, written by the great fool scholar Huang Gung Wang at the Zhejiang Hall, belonging to Mr. Xia of Yunzhen. End of inscription. Well, I could quote from this over and over as we look at the painting, pointing out how this or that passage in the painting illustrates what Huang Guang wrote, but I'll refrain from doing that and let you apply what he writes to understanding what he paints by yourselves. Okay, now back to the painting. <clears throat> the later history of the scroll is also told in my book, those pages 111 to 112. In brief, it's this. It was owned by famous artists and collectors, including Sun Zhou, Dong Xi Chang, one 17th century owner named Wu Hongyu, determined as he was dying to take it with him into the afterworld, and so he rose up from his sickbed to throw it into the stove. Fortunately, his nephew snatched it out in time to save all but an opening section. The outer layers, that is, of the rolled scroll were burned. The main scroll went on to pass through other famous collections and be acquired by the Chenlong Emperor in the 18th century. What could be preserved of the first section was separately transmitted, called the Cut-Off Mountain Painting, and ended in the Zhejiang Provincial Museum, with the main scroll going, of course, to the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. And the two remained physically apart until earlier this year, as I said earlier, they were briefly joined when the Zhejiang Provincial Museum lent the Cut-Off Mountains fragment to the National Palace Museum in Taiwan, and they were exhibited together. During one of my stays in China, the next place, I persuaded my hosts in Hangzhou to send me in a car with a guide to view the Fuchun Mountains, uh, which I wanted to see because of this famous scroll. And they really turned out to be quite modest hills. I took a slide or two of them, but I can't locate these, ne these now. And instead, I show this one of myself and my attractive guide with some of these hills in the background. Not very impressive, the hills that is, but uh, given the charm of the guide, I could have dwelt on the Fuchun Mountains for some time, but it was only a day trip, and I never saw her again. Next, please. So here is a fragment made from a slide I took at the Zhejiang Provincial Museum many years ago. I'll keep it on the screen while I show a series of details from it also made at that time. First, the rounded earth form that begins the upward rise of this mountain. It's really just a modest hill, like the ones in the photo I just showed. But we see Huang's simple houses, his shaping strokes, the first of the clusters of boulders with dark vegetation that mark the stages in the upward slope. Next, please. Just to the right of this, the slope with trees and rocks. Nothing at all impressive pictorially, but it reveals, as the whole painting does, the way it came into existence by brief, spontaneous episodes when Huang found time to paint in some, some more of it within the outlines of the composition that he had quickly sketched in when he first began working on the scroll. Next. Below and to the left, houses and trees. The round white spots are 
places where the mounter is pasted new paper over holes as he repaired and remounted it. The diverse trees, the raised shoreline, lines painted over other lines all show us vividly the process of creation. Uh, this is one large aspect of the huge impact the scroll has on the history of Chinese painting. We almost feel as if we're watching Huang painting it. Um, this is what's made one of the things that's made it the most famous and sought after of all Chinese paintings. The equivalent for painting of the Long Ting Gathering Manuscript for Calligraphy, which by just next month, by the way, late October, is going to be in an exhibition and symposium on that at the uh, Palace Museum in Beijing, the Long Ting Gathering Manuscript, that is. Next, please. A bit to the left, another detail of houses and trees. The plainness of scenery. That's another key to the uniqueness of the scroll. With perhaps a single predecessor and possible model among extant paintings, that is Zhang Mengfu's Village by the Water of 1302, which is plate 13 in my Hills Beyond a River book, Huang Gongwang departs from the long tradition of landscapists choosing impressive, distinctive scenery to paint or create. He makes the plainest of materials visually exciting by the way he represents them. Next, please. A bit further up the slope, one of the clusters of rocks. We can remember how early landscapists endlessly emphasized the importance of creating scenery and paintings as nature creates it in nature, as if without purpose, no sense of design. Now Huang Gongwang accomplishes something comparable in a very different mode. Loose, free brushwork, looking improvised, momentary, natural in this sense. It's a mode and a manner that one can scarcely analyze. One can only admire it and respond to it. Next, please. The left section of the cut-off mountains fragment, showing the slope of the hill, a further shore, and more houses and trees in the foreground. What preceded this fragment, the truly burned and destroyed opening section, we can't know, except perhaps from a copy made before the burning, of which I'll show images later. But the images I, I have don't include the, this opening section, so here's a job for somebody. Recreate Huang's opening passage. Interesting article. Next, please. Closer in, another small detail of houses and trees. That is, uh, more subject that is no subject. But even here, we can enjoy the move from the darker group of buildings in the upper left, which first draws our eye, to the bridges or raised walkways over what must be a stream or swampy ground below them, and then to the faintly drawn houses below. Did he mean to go back and draw over these as he worked over the whole painting during the whole three years he spent on it, sporadically taking it up and putting it down? Perhaps he did. But that's the right kind of question, unanswerable but right, to have in mind when we look closely at such passages. The next, please. And finally, for this cut-off mountain fragment, this detail showing showing what? Hills beyond a river again. The essential subject of much of the best of Yuan painting, no two depictions of it alike, the best of them bringing us high levels of visual interest, along with low levels of properly scenic interest. Here we arrive at the best basis for the insistence of C.C. C. Wong and others that we shouldn't look at the scenery, we should look at the brushwork. Here it works, has its validity although for much other Chinese paintings I now realize it's totally wrong. Now, back to the main scroll as it survives in Taiwan. Next, please. Here's the beginning of the main scroll in Taipei. The inscription written on the mounting before the painting uh, is by Dong Xi Chang. Even those of you who don't read Chinese can probably recognize his inscriptions by now. We've seen so many of them. Dong saw the scroll in 1596, when it was owned by his patron, Shang Yuanbian. The painting simply continues what we saw already in the fragment, the end of the peninsula that began with the hill there, stretches of river shore with trees and houses at the bottom. Next, a detail of this. Even without the information of Huang's inscription, that we, well, we would know that this was not like much of earlier painting, the kind of picture in which the artist worked towards some fixed ending. There was no time, that is, when the painting was finished. He could have gone on painting it when the mood struck him for years more. 
The little Tingsa, or viewing shelter, on the shore in the lower right reminds us of those we've seen in many early paintings. But if we imagine sitting in it and looking, uh, looking out, what would we see? Only the most ordinary, unremarkable scenery. We could make a vertical detail of this Tingsa on the shore and distant hills and have the essential composition that another of the Yuan Four Great Masters, Huang's younger friend and admirer, needs on, would make the subject of endless paintings that vary only in composition. Nizan painted this thing over and over, a tingza on the shore and a few trees and hills beyond a river. Next, please. The middle ground and far peninsulas and for a stretch of space we see only trees in the foreground. The channeling emperor has written one of his inscriptions in the sky, or rather he's had it written for him by one of his court connoisseurs. As I'll relate later in connection with the main copy, he believed this real scroll to be the copy, and he wrote inscriptions all over the bad one, uh, sparing this one, thank God. Well, I'll talk about that later. Next, please. A detail with the viewing pavilions built out from the river's edge. The bare trees are visually lively, their branches ending in what almost look like hands with downward pointing fingers. A few smudges of ink quickly and as if randomly applied with a sideward held brush give the shore all the shaping it's going to get. Next please. Then the river view ends and we reach the first of the several ridges, mountains, uh, hills that is, that push up out of the top of the scroll and divide its spaces. It rises leftward and upward to its crest and then it curves back rightward into the far distance. Its gentle curve enclosing space that separates it from a smaller rise of land to the right. In the space between these, next please. In the space between these is set a larger complex of buildings, some of them multi story. This may be the villa of some prominent dweller in the Fuchun Hills, and it might well have been identifiable in the scrolls to the scrolls recipient and others. Above it to the left is a small building centered exactly within the curve of the ridge. I remember that John Hay, good friend, one of the most interesting of the Chinese painting scholars of the generation after mine, who wrote his doctoral dissertation for Princeton on this painting, John Hay saw this house as the real center of the whole composition because it's perfectly placed by the principles of feng shui or geomancy. I'm not either endorsing or arguing against his interpretation, simply recalling it. And I can't remember enough to send you to any publication or writing uh, by him in which this argument is made. It may be only in this unpublished doctoral dissertation on this painting, which of course I read. John Hay is still very much alive, retired and living with his wife in France after years of teaching at UC Santa Cruz. Next please. My own argument about this section of the scroll would be a different one, more formal and perhaps less penetrating, that the front face of the rising ridge, seen here in a black and white detail that I had made to use in making this point, uh, is another example of the formal construction system I've been talking about. Gently upward curving earth masses punctuated by horizontal groups of smaller, lumpier forms and dark vegetation. It isn't so schematic here as in the stone cliff at the Pond of Heaven painting, which we saw before, probably because this is an original, but also because it's smaller as a hand scroll and you can't present the viewer with any such bold, semi-abstract formal systems uh, for viewing up close. Most viewers, in fact, would be unaware that any system under, underlies the building of the ridge. The next, please. <clears throat> In the section that follows the tall hill slopes down and distant hilltops, one hesitates to call them mountains after seeing them, appear in the distance. Below them a simple alternation, dark rows of trees, land, band of fog, all stretching across the space between this and the next tall rise. That one features a similar but simpler built up slope facing toward us and beyond that another valley and another lower hill this one with a projection of land coming toward us and ending in a passage of river shore with trees. Still further left, that is rolling on as hand scrolls are always rolled, uh, another tall ridge rises and on it slopes another cluster of houses. The scenery is of the simplest. 
its elements repeat themselves loosely, and one has to look close to see the real main interest of the painting, how all this is depicted, in the quiet but endlessly varied, somehow visually absorbing hand of Huang Gung Wang, that element of the painting that is loosely called brushwork, but for which a term like hand of the artist is better, is something like what draws us into the actual making, the facture, to use the art historian's term, of a painting by Rembrandt or by Van Gogh or artists like that. Next, please. Detail of the distant hilltops. Throughout the painting, we're made aware of a condition of unfinish or semi-finish. It's clear that Huang could have gone on painting it, adding brushwork, building up forms, clarifying images, more or less endlessly. This gives the whole an air of spontaneity that adds greatly to its interest. Note in the lower right corner of this detail the rocks that he began to paint over the light surface strokes of the hillside. Nothing like this would have been tolerated in a Sung Academy painting or in a professional artist painting, generally. It's a mark of the amateur's hand, an assertion of disdain for fine finish, the urge to let the making of the work remain visible in the finished work. I won't elaborate on what this will recall in Western painting, or note how recently anything really comparable appears in it. No, on second thought I will. This morning's art section in the New York Times, September 14, 2011, that is, has a review of a new Willem de Kooning retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it quotes the curator as saying that de Kooning, quote, was an artist all about process. Well, great new idea, except that Huang Gung Wang and others had it 600 years earlier. We'll see another more close-up details as we go on, which will make this aspect of the painting even clearer. Next, please. <clears throat> A shorter section with a ridge that projects into foreground and the valley with houses. This is the section that I chose to reproduce in my Scira book, choosing it because it serves so well to illustrate just that character of the work. The closest part in lower right is especially revealing of all this. Next, please. As this closer detail eloquently shows us, I wish I could have used such details in my old publications. Even so, I was criticized in several reviews of my Scura book for including so many details and sections of pictures without showing their holes. Now I'm unable to evoke any real Western parallel because there isn't one, really. The media our artists have used don't allow it, even drawings, which perhaps come closest. Things are drawn freely over other things, a process allowed by the basic means of dark, darker brushwork over lighter, a very different mode of building a painting from that from oil painting, uh, in which each opaque stroke hides what's below. If I were to choose a single image to convey what's most exciting in the work of Huang Gung Wang, this would be it. I feel I must go on talking about it, even with nothing more to say. The sharp-eyed will note what may be a tiny human figure inside the Tingzi, situated at the right side of it as if seated on a rail. The earth mass, or boulder in middle right, from which pine trees grow, was enlarged from an earlier, smaller form, which can still be discerned before Huang decided to make it push still further leftward, closer to the Tingzi. Notice that the pine trees are distinguished from the willow tree below and at left, mainly by the way their leafage points upward, while the tendrils of the willow hang down. There, I've exhausted my means of keeping you glued to the screen gazing at and into this detail. I trust that it's opened your eyes in figurative and literal ways. Next, please. In the long section that follows, the succession of hills, not individualized, stretches as if monotonously off to the distant horizon. That much is quiet, lulling. But below, as one rolls, a fisherman in a boat and an impossibly long pine tree overhanging the water prepares for a surprise a waterside pavilion built under the trees, with another figure in it, and beyond that another fisherman in his boat, seen between the trees. Next, please. A detail of the receding hillsides. I feel a deep gratitude to that long-ago James Cahill for making these details that bring out exactly what I want to talk about half a century later. That comment applies to this whole series of video lectures, by the way. I'm reliving those times when I went around seeing the paintings, 
all over the world and shooting thousands of Kodachrome slides from them. Next, please. The passage in the foreground, by contrast, is full of pictorial detail and variety of forms. A man identified by his cap as a literatus sits at the edge of a waterside pavilion, leaning over to feed the geese who swim toward him. Any viewer acquainted with Yuan painting will immediately associate this image with representations of the great calligrapher Wang Shijie gazing at geese from a similar waterside pavilion. I reproduced one of these by Chen Shan in my Skira book. This is as close to a narrative detail as Huang uses in his whole painting, most of which is made up of unpeopled landscape. The next. The section that follows is as bare of detail as the receding series of hills, but this time it's a series of low, flat-topped earth banks over which we pass an imagination into middle distance, where a group of trees relieves this seeming monotony. Next, please. But again, the monotony is dispelled when one moves in closer, lowering one's head in imagination, so to speak, to look at the scroll from nearer, nearer, closer up. When this proves to be another passage charged with a kind of quiet visual excitement, the brushwork is more consistent here with less of dry over wet, darker over lighter overlay, but Huang still manages to keep a sense of restless activity and creativity alive within the seeming repetitiveness of his brushwork. Next. The group of trees continues leftward and divides, one continuation of it moving back into distance where it meets a long horizontal spit of land joined to it by a single bridge. The other draws us back to the foreground where a spindly pair of trees overhangs the water. Huang may have meant to fill out this group later, or he may have intended this bareness. A pair of boats with fishermen drawn up side by side as if the men were conversing appears offshore. The horizontal spit in middle distance continues as one rolls leftward, next please, to be joined after a time by some more distant hills on the horizon to terminate ultimately in still another tall hill that pushes against the top of the painting. It's a sudden and dramatic appearance, not given the kind of gradual build-up that had preceded the hills earlier in the scroll. Next, please. The long horizontal spit ends with another cluster of houses among trees, and it's connected to the long spit by a bridge over which a man with a cane is walking. But when we come to look closely at the tall, steep-sided hill or mountain in itself, next please, we are confronted by something entirely new and different from all that went before. This is the most startling detail in the scroll. And it can only be seen, I've always believed, as done by Huang Gung Wong in a great hurry, kind of near frenzy, perhaps, when drunk. He doesn't merely relax his hand, he appears to lose control over it makes seemingly random dots, draws the brush sideward before lifting it so it leaves a streak off to the left. The only way this can be understood, I think, is by imagining Huang in 1350, shortly before he gave the scroll to Wu Yong, thinking to himself, so, this person pushes me to finish the scroll and give it to him. I'll finish it all right. And he dashes it off without exercising his usual control and moderation perhaps, as I say, while inebriated or tipsy. I recall one morning in 1961 when this scroll was in a case at the National Gallery in Washington when the Chinese Art Treasure Exhibition was showing there, visiting the gallery before it opened to the public, and finding camera people f filming this end passage in the scroll. The job of making film footage from the exhibition to be eventually edited into a film that would be sold for education purposes should have gone to an experienced filmmaker. H.C. Wang, or Wang Go Wang, was one such, and he wanted very much to make the film. But the National Gallery was forced by government rules to give the job to the lowest bidder, which happened to be a company whose previous job had been a film for a company that made dental equipment. They had no experience with photographing art, much less Chinese art. So here they were, photographing this odd ending of this great scroll, the worst part to choose for representing it. I asked them why they were doing it, and I was told, because there were electrical cords for the lights would only reach that far. <laughs> the footage they took all proved useless, and the educational film was never made. Next, please. 
The scroll ends quietly as Huang Gung Wang seems to decide that he has done enough for Master Wu Yong and will finish it off fast. The distant hills trail off quickly and empty space occupies the rest to the end where Wang's inscription is written. Unfortunately, as I've said, I don't have an image of it. And so, not at all, the smashed conclusion ends this most prestigious of Chinese paintings, the grand masterwork of Huang Gung Wang. It entirely deserves that status, which I think is only enhanced after we look at it carefully and try to understand the circumstances of its creation, as I've tried to do here. Next, I'll dispose quickly of what was once a serious issue, that is, the existence of two old versions of this composition. The other one, of which the first two sections are seen here, incomplete, uh, at one time had its partisans who argued that it, not the other one, the, not the one we've been looking at, is the genuine work. They included several notable people whom I won't name. Virtually nobody, I think, takes this one seriously anymore. It, bear, uh, it bears a different would-be artist's inscription, dedicating the work to a different person and adding a date corresponding to 1338. Colophones by notable collectors are attached to it, and it also entered the Imperial Chenlong Collection. Fortunately, it entered the Imperial Collection before the genuine work was acquired. The Chenlong Emperor was so excited over having acquired this famous painting that he wrote inscriptions all over it, filling sky and water areas, totally ruining it as a painting. Next, please. Here are the last two sections in the first of many colophones. When, some years later, the Emperor acquired also the real Fuchun Scroll, the one we looked at, at length. He, he could not reverse himself and admit that he had made an imperial mistake, so he had one of his court connoisseurs write the shorter inscription that we saw near the opening of the good scroll, identifying this new acquisition as a copy of the great original one that he already owned, and so forth. So this great work was saved from another disaster, which would have been nearly as bad as, as being burned, being defaced with imperial inscriptions. We can be thankful for both rescues, which allow us to enjoy a great work of art in good, undefiled condition. The later surviving works of Huang Gung Wang can be seen more quickly. They are few in number and simpler in character, perhaps because he was older and less inclined to put a lot of time and effort into any single work. This one, for which I have no, no detail images, is a hanging scroll ink on silk in the Palace Museum in Beijing and is titled The Nine Peaks After Snowfall. Huang's inscription on it contains a cyclical date corresponding to 1349. Uh, I think the painting is probably genuine. It features another of Huang's rising slopes, using his older mode of construction, but not rigorously, simplifying the forms. Further peaks behind and at both sides are shown only in silhouette, but shaded below to set them off spatially from each other than from the main central mass. The composition echoes in some respects the Northern Song monumental landscape type, which Huang Gung Wang must have known from fine examples, uh, and the scattering of vegetation dotting on some of the mountaintops might be seen as a very late Fan Quan style element. Some of Huang's characteristic flat top forms are seen at the left, and in the lower right, a cluster of houses. The painting represents an admirable engagement with large landscape problems, impressive as the work of an 80 year old artist. Next, please. Sometime in the 1980s or 90s, I can't recall when, but too late for inclusion in my index, another work in this style by Huang Gung Wang, or deserving serious attention as his work at least. I haven't seen it in the original, and I have only this image made from a reproduction, uh, turned up in a provincial museum in China, it may have been Sichuan, arousing some understandable flurry of interest. The similarities to the Nine Peaks painting are obvious, and I won't point them out. This one, however, isn't just a pure landscape, but has a kind of narrative theme. In the lower left is a boat, probably with a passenger to be seen in it, and in the middle right, a cluster of houses, all this set in a wintry landscape. Any cultivated Chinese viewer will immediately recognize this as representing the theme of visiting Dai, an anecdote from the Eastern Jin period that was taken to illustrate the unworldliness and the absence of purposefulness 
that characterized that the ideal figures of that age, the seven sages of the bamboo grove or others. In the story, the, calli the calligrapher artist Wang Huizhi, son of the greatest calligrapher Wang Shijie, decided suddenly one wintry evening to visit his friend Dai Kui, who lived, who lived in reclusion in the mountains. Wang Huizhi traveled by boat through the snowy landscape until he reached Dai Kui's house. But then he turned back without going in to meet his friend. Asked why, he replied, and I cite this from memory, that he had gone to visit his friend carried by exhilaration, by the excitement of seeing him again. But when he arrived, the exhilaration had run out. He felt no need to actually visit Dai. Well, for a comparable story, a personal memory that this one reminds me of, visit my website, jameskahill.info, pull down the reminiscences and read number 33 about two young people, one of them myself, who on a snowy wintry night in 1947 were drinking together in a hotel room in Seoul, Korea, and suddenly decided to climb a nearby mountain and stay at the Buddhist monastery near its peak. The difference is that we didn't turn back, but we pounded on the gate to rouse the monks and slept briefly in the monastery before getting up to see the sunrise from the peak. Now back to Hong Gong Wan. Next, please. The theme of visiting Dai was often depicted by later artists. This is an example by an early Ming master, Zhou Wanjing. The composition is similar with Huang Huizhi's boat in lower left and Dai Kui's house above to the right, all set in a wintry scene with dark water and dark sky, conveying both the season and the time of day or night. Next. This painting, which I can only show in a bad image taken from the internet, I don't have good slides of it, is titled The Fuchun Daling Tu, or Fuchun Mountain Range. It's in ink on paper, was in the collection of the great Shanghai collector Peng Yuanji, and is presently in the Nanjing Museum. I can't remember having seen it in the original, but it looked quite possible as a genuine work from Huang's late period, featuring the build-up of flat forms typical of these late works. A road built out from the hillside moves from the lower right corner up and to the left. The hills rise above as in other late works, with a ravine and upper right crossed by an arched bridge. Next. Let me put on briefly beside it this hanging scroll in the National Palace Museum, Taipei, supposed to be a work by Huang Gong Wang titled Strange Peaks at Dongting. I dismissed it in my index as a Ming work, perhaps by one Zheng Ming whose inscription is on it. In any case, it's too full of unnecessary detail, too elaborate, to be a work by Huang Gong Wang. His clarity of composition has been lost. A pretty good Ming painting that is in Huang Gong Wang's style. Next, please. This painting, also in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, painted in ink on paper and titled The Nine Pearls Peak, is only attributed to Huang Gong Wang. There's no signature. But Li Lin San argued for its being a genuine work by him, and Zhuang Shun, the son of Zhuang Yan, gave a brief paper on it in the 1970 symposium in Taipei that I've spoken of many times. That's the symposium that also had Suzuki K's paper on Xia Gui and my own on Wu Bin and others. It looks quite plausible as a late work of Huang Gong Wang, and it's certainly among those to be taken seriously. Next, please. Lots of details in it, as seen in this closer-in image, can be recognized as resembling those in his reliable works. On the other hand, as always, we have to acknowledge that there probably were many close and convincing imitations of Huang's works uh, being done in his own time and shortly after, and that they probably were good enough to fool people of his time. And a work like this could be one of those. Again, a problem that I leave for future research. Next, please. This, a painting by Huang Gong Wang, painted in ink on paper, with a single touch of color, is to be found in a hand scroll in the Palace Museum in Beijing, uh, in which the principal work is a piece of calligraphy by Zhao Meng Fu. Huang painted the picture as a kind of pictorial colophon to that work of calligraphy. I saw it and arranged for it to be reproduced in my section on Yuan painting in the 3000 Years book, or its figure 157 on page 69. 169. Uh, it dates from the 1340s. Zhao had written for Huang four large characters, clearing after sudden snow, loosely copied after the same four characters written in a letter by Wang Shijie. 
Later, probably around 1345, Huang presented this, this scroll to a certain Ma Jing, Ma Jing Xing, and he added this painting representing the same theme, clearing after sudden snow. The painting itself is unsigned, uninscribed, but it can safely be accepted as Huang's work because of its placement in the scroll. It's an ink monochrome except for a red wintry sun. It depicts a large house overlooking a mountain valley surrounded by tall cliffs. The rocks and cliffs are done in feathery soft brushwork, but are given volume by showing their sloping tops and receding sides, a form that Huang has adopted from northern Sun landscape. We saw it in works by Yen Wen Gui and Fan Quan and others. It was later to be used by Huang's disciple Ni Zan and by many artists of the Zhou school in the 17th century. It's amazing how much of later literati landscape painting has its origins in the work of Huang Gong Wang. Finally for Huang Gong Wang, next please. Here is a small picture, ink on paper, that he painted in 1352. I reproduced it for the first time, I think, with my article on quickness and spontaneity in Chinese painting which is printed in my Three Alternative Histories book, where it's figure 62 on page 86. In its small and modest way, it's a great example of spontaneity and of painting as a revelation of process and of how the circumstances of creation affect the work. His friend Shouzhi, Huang writes on it, his writing filling the whole sky area, as you see, brought him this half sheet of paper asking the old fool, that is Huang himself, who used this name in his late years, asking the old fool to paint a landscape on it. But he hadn't had any free time, and besides it was the hottest time of summer, and he was perspiring. Anybody who has spent days in Hangzhou in the hottest part of summer, as I have, knows how he felt. Painting a picture is the last thing you want to do. Thinking back to the ancients, Huang continues, we realized that their paintings were hard to obtain because they, quote, spent five days on one stream, ten days on one stone, end quote. This is an old formulation for slow, careful painting taken from a couplet that the great Tang poet Du Fu wrote about a contemporary painter named Wang Zai. Uh, he wrote, ten days to paint one rock, five days to paint one stone, an accomplished artist cannot be hurried, end quote. I quote this near the end of uh, my quickness and spontaneity article, and Huang Gong Wang adds, quote, with Shouzhi hurrying him and pressing him like this, Wang Zai could never have produced a genuine work. So his friend Shouzhi got, for whatever gift he had brought, not only a pleasantly sketchy picture, but a piece of Huang's calligraphy and a learned joke as well. Well, I don't need to talk about the picture. You've been looking at it for some minutes, and everything in it is already familiar anyway. And I'll let it serve as a final lesson to all those who think that every genuine work by a great artist like Huang Gong Wang has to be a major work of art. Huang has effectively answered them in his inscription. Okay, good place to end this very long lecture. The longest so far on a single artist, I think. I trust it's been rewarding for all those with eyes to see and everybody else will long since have gone off to watch TV instead. The end. Mm -hmm.